Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, I don't know about you, but phrases like that leave me feeling uneasy. After all, Christianity is a religion of repentance and forgiveness. But here we have Jesus himself telling me there is at least one thing I could potentially do that would leave me with no way out. Eternally guilty, never forgiven. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Whatever that means. Whenever I hear that phrase, I always think back to this random documentary I saw as a college student. It was by a man who had decided to reject his Christian faith, and he sort of walks through these various criticisms against the church and religion at large. To be honest, I don't really remember many of the details. They weren't particularly original arguments. I don't even remember the name of the film. But I do remember how it ends. It ends with this man entering into a church and making this pronouncement. I blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. He announces this out loud as this final and complete rejection of his Christian upbringing, of his baptism, and of this God who he no longer believes in. Now, I have to be honest with you. The main thing I remember about this scene is just how anticlimactic it was. Of course, there were no lightning bolts in response. The earth didn't shake, but that's not really what I mean. What was so anticlimactic was just how hollow of a proclamation it turned out to be. He pronounced it, but did he really do it? What does it actually mean to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? It seems like clarity on that point is important since the consequences are apparently so dire. Unfortunately, Mark here doesn't really help us much in his retelling. The statement is sandwiched between this strange conflict he is having with his family and a parable about divided kingdoms and plundered houses. To really get to the root of this blasphemy, we need to carefully tease out what is happening. So let's begin with where we are at in Mark's gospel today. So Jesus has just recently been baptized by John, ushering in his public ministry. He's gathered the 12 disciples and has been making a name for himself as he travels around Galilee, healing the sick, casting out demons, and teaching with authority. So already he's started to make a name for himself, and even got the attention of those in charge who are uneasy with this upstart ministry. Then Jesus decides to head back home with this new reputation and with disciples in tow. That's where our gospel reading begins today. The crowd presses in, a bit over-familiar perhaps, 
to see what's up with this guy who they all remember having grown up down the street. These are his neighbors, his childhood friends, people who would have watched him grow up. And then the stakes quickly begin to rise. His family immediately comes out to diffuse the situation, to usher him away from public view. Remember, in the ancient world, the basic unit of society was the family. This was not an individualistic culture. Your family was your identity. And if Jesus now brings shame onto himself, he is bringing shame onto the whole family. If the neighbors start talking about Jesus losing his mind, then the common wisdom of the day says out of self-preservation alone, it is time to intervene. And then to confirm the family's concerns, here come the scribes, the religious experts from the big city to announce that Jesus is not just out of his mind, but actually in league with the devil. That all that healing and teaching is in fact a demonic power and not of God at all. So we've got all this commotion around Jesus and his disciples. The skeptical crowd is gathered around them. His family is trying to rush him away. And the scribes are here full of serious accusations. And what Jesus does in response to all this is to call the scribes over to him and to begin this discourse with them using parables to demonstrate just how off base they are. He points out that their own line of reasoning is nonsensical by making this comparison to human kingdoms. Why would the devil use his power to frustrate his own workings? What kind of ruler of a kingdom would do something like that? And if he did, his kingdom would surely fall. It's really a brilliant strategy of rhetoric here. If the scribes deny Jesus's assertion here, then they contradict their own accusation. But if they accept it, then they end up agreeing with him, and thus their initial accusation is proven false. From here, Jesus goes on to explain to them what his plan really is. He points out that the devil may be a strong man. After all, we can all see the results of evil around us. But that he, Jesus, is in fact stronger. And that while Satan may seem to have the run of the house right now, Jesus will be binding up the devil and plundering his house. That is, as we know, he will himself enter the very realm of the dead and free all those who appeared to be the property of death. And when Jesus does this, he will break down those gates of hell that have kept us captive. And there is nothing the devil can do to stop him. And now we come to the point. After this parable, with Jesus pointing out that those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, those who do so cannot have forgiveness. And we'll see how that word, have, turns out to be key. 
But what is it that has prompted Jesus to make this point? What is it that the scribes have accused Jesus of? Well, they've claimed that the work that Jesus has done in the power of the Spirit, the healing, the casting out of demons, the miracles, they claimed that this work of the Spirit was, in fact, the work of the devil that it was demonic. They have encountered holiness, and they have named it evil. But note that it's not just that they've mistaken evil for good or good for evil. That's a problem we all fall into. No, the problem here is that they've attributed what they know is holy for evil. That's what Jesus' parable about divided kingdoms reveals. They have chosen to reject goodness here. And this is important because it reveals to us that what makes blasphemy against the Holy Spirit unforgivable is not that this just happens to be a sin that God is unwilling to forgive us of. Like we have all these rules, and this is the one rule that you really aren't allowed to break. As if this is just a bridge too far, even for God. No, the problem here is in the state of the heart. Because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is really about knowingly rejecting the good that has been offered to you. Or to put it another way, the unforgivable sin is really the sin of rejecting forgiveness. It is to refuse God's forgiveness. To refuse to have forgiveness. To refuse to possess what God is offering you. After all, we all make mistakes. We all, at times, confuse good and bad. Sometimes we pursue what we think is good only to discover it was bad. But be willing to recognize your fault. Be willing to receive forgiveness, and you can be assured that you have not committed this unforgivable sin. This is why I think the ending to that documentary rang so hollow for me. The producer clearly cared about good and evil, was clearly wrestling with the wrongs done in the name of Christianity as he laid out his arguments. And his ultimate rejection of it seemed to come from this place of seeking the good as he understood it. Do I believe his conclusion is mistaken? Of course. But was he blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? Was he calling what he knew was good evil? That I'm not so sure of. But ultimately, what this scene from Mark's gospel wants us to know with all its commotion and conflict and these heavy themes about family and Satan and forgiveness. What Mark wants us to know is that Jesus is here to do his Father's will. He has come to defeat the devil and all the forces of evil that are inflicted on our world. And he has come with the Spirit to bring healing and wholeness 
and forgiveness to all who desire it. This is what Jesus offers you. To have forgiveness. To be healed. And to transform your very identity through adoption into Christ's family.